Perhaps most telling is that if you suggest to the average person that maybe God does not exist, he will likely respond with less emotion and less hostility than if you bring up the idea of life without government. This indicates which religion people are more deeply emotionally attached to and which religion they actually believe in more firmly. Excellent quote from The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose. Give me your favorite anarchism, voluntarism, libertarianism quote in the, dis, uh, in the comment section. And my favorite quote will get this autographed book of Larkin Roses. Today, we're going to discuss something Larkin Rose put on called Candles in the Dark with a couple gentlemen from Actual Anarchy, where they discuss the anarcho-capitalist perspective on movies. Uh, Robert, give me a little intro into what Actual Anarchy is. Well, hey, Keith, thanks for having us on. Actual Anarchy is the real deal anarchy. It is human interaction operating voluntarily. It is the lack of ruler there's not the lack of rules. Yay, that sounds terrific. And the great thing is, is you've, you've tapped into the pop culture. So it's something, as opposed to being this anarchism in Austrian economics, I don't know any of those. What they do is they take a movie a lot of people have seen, and then they give the libertarian perspective on it. It's really uh, terrific. So instead of just talking about the candles in the dark, I'm going to uh, walk through a role play of me attempting to uh, switch these two from status to anarchists, obviously it's a role play. So are you ready? I think Dan is going to be the victim. Yeah, I got my road here. I'm on the road, I love roads and there's no way you can talk me out of it. We need roads and they're super important. Well, see, Dan, I, I love roads too. I just don't believe in violently funding them, but I wanna get our conversation started. Dan, mm, what do you think there's anything morally justified that a uh, government can do that um, Apple, the company, can't morally do? Sure, yeah, yeah. The government has uh, the right and ability to protect the security of the American people. And so sometimes they need to be able to view metadata and record conversations and analyze them to make sure that terroristic threats and other things aren't uh, going to threaten people in this country. Does anyone have that right, or does government uh, have a monopoly on that right? Well, I think everyone has a right to be aware of threats that are uh, potentially going to harm them or others. And so, yeah, it should be uh, a right for everyone to be able to do something like that. And, and us banding together to vote for politicians to represent our interests and protect our streets and protect our roads, uh, I think is very important and vital. So you originally said Apple and government, uh, the government has the right to do things Apple doesn't, but then you said, yeah, everyone has the right to do what the NSA does. So that's not really getting at the heart of the disagreement. I'm curious, what do you think government has the right to do no one else does? For example, uh, does the Catholic Church have the right to issue taxes? I think that uh, they do a form of tithing that's sort of akin to taxes. I'm not too familiar with the Catholic Church, but back when uh, I was a church going person, they would pass the plate around. And even though it was sort of, uh, it was a, a moral or sort of sort of a moral imposition on you to donate uh, because, you know, if people saw you just pass the plate, uh, you would get looked down upon. There was a social pressure. So sure. much same with, with our tax system. Like if, if somebody, uh, realizes that, say, Donald Trump didn't pay his fair share. Well, you know, that means that he's getting more than other people are. That he's getting more. Um, okay, I, I, I didn't follow the, the, the end of that. Um, so what do you think should happen to someone who doesn't tithe to the Catholic Church? They should be excommunicated, thrown out of the church. They're not willing to, to participate in the funding, so they shouldn't get to reap the benefits. So if they don't like it, they can leave, go to another church. Oh, yeah. Well, everyone, including the tithers, have that right or that ability to go elsewhere. Uh, the question is, do you think, assuming you're not a member of a certain congregation, do they have the right to accept people who do not tithe? 
the church could decide to do that, but it's it's up to them. It's up to church leadership to make that determination for their congregation. Now, again, I'm not like a super religious person, so I'm sort of speaking out of turn, but I'm looking at them as a private uh, organization. You know, it's it's their house, their rules. They can do what they wish. So let's say the Catholic Church uh, started regulating uh, Best Buy. Would they have the right to forcibly take money from Best Buy against their will if they desired to? Well, that's, that's just a weird question. Like, why would the church have anything to do with Best Buy? You'd, you'd think so. You, you really would think so. However, when dealing with government, what you're actually saying is one group of people, government has a right to tax, not just the church and Best Buy, but all organizations within a geographical area, which they did not acquire through voluntary exchange or original appropriation. So it's the Best Buy example times a billion. Uh, do you, so if the Catholic Church doesn't have the right to make rules and force their will upon those who have not contracted with them, why does government have that right in the form of lawmaking, legislation, and taxation? Well, because we, again, band together and vote every couple of years. Our voices are heard, and the majority gets to decide which direction the country is going to go, and we follow that via a uh, democratic. Our democracy is very important. And it's, it's how we uh, make corrections for what the legal structures need to be. We address situations as they come up. We improve over time. It's not perfect, but it's the best system there is, as Churchill said. And, and Keith, just to butt in here, the, the government is in the business of protecting this country. The Catholic Church, it's not in their interest, or they have a, somewhat of an interest to protect some of it, but it's... The government's business, you know, their whole modus operandi is to protect us and protect this area, this place. So they have to have the right to collect taxes and defend us. I will deal with Robert's uh, objection first. So if they don't defend us, um, if government doesn't defend us and say there's an attack, does that then make government illegitimate? Well, nobody's perfect, Keith. I mean... They can't be a hundred percent of the place, hundred percent of the time. I could walk out on the street and get attacked. I, I wouldn't say it was the government's fault I got attacked. Your justification for the existence of that government was that they keep you safe. So let's say I don't think they're doing that. Do I have the right to opt out, as in not contribute through funding? Well, just because you don't realize that you are in fact being protected and don't appreciate it, you are you are marginally safer. You are relatively safer than if there were no government in that position to provide some level of security. You know, that would be an interesting discussion. I'm not really sure if governments protect us or they create blowback through foreign policy or if their civil asset forfeiture steals more than the average person would, or if they're stealing trillions in taxation annually is worse Wait, than what what's private the the would. Jargon? But uh, I, I'm actually not sure about that. The question is, do I have the right to forcibly take money from you and, and while doing so claim to represent your safety and well-being as you say government has the right to do? Are you in the business of doing that, Keith? I, I'm not sure I follow this question. This is this is confusing me. Yeah, I didn't vote for you. <laughs> um, yeah, most people didn't vote for Trump, but he's still in there. So it has nothing to do with who votes. And it's not like the people who don't vote or participate uh, get to opt out. Um, do, do you believe that uh, the majority has the right to coercively rule the minority? Well, how else would you do it? Like, like it's not a perfect court. system, but what else are you going to do, Keith? I don't understand. You want people and machine guns in the back of trucks and warlords? You know, I actually don't know how, I mean, I don't even know how this book is made, let alone how security would be done with 7 billion people voluntarily interacting based off incentives and voluntary exchanges. But what I do, what I'm saying is I'm attempting to make the moral claim. Government has no rights that any other organization doesn't have. And I'm also saying violence is immoral. The only two ways to justly engage with others 
is through voluntary exchange and uh, cooperation through contract or originally appropriating um, property. Uh, so I have yet oh, to- Wait, 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 hold on. You said violence is never justified, but I can defend myself with violence and therefore I can give that right to a government to defend me from threats, both internal, foreign and domestic. Uh, you have that right, and that's uh, why you have the right to delegate it to anyone. What makes government unique is they claim to have the right without first getting the consent of those they claim to be defending. So even when governments commit genocide and don't defend the populace, or there is an attack amongst the populace they claim to protect, they don't stop their rulership. Um, it, it's much more of a smokescreen than an actual contract or deal. Uh, that's why well, government is unique because the baby out with the bath water. Water. just I'm because sorry? a few, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater just because a few bad actors got into power and did some bad stuff. It doesn't mean that the whole institution is wrong. Uh, it needs, it means we need better protections and, uh, and better methods of electing our leaders and making sure that they follow the rules as written by the, the founders and go through the proper procedures of getting amendments made and, and getting the laws changed. If you want to get your, your ideas out there in the arena of ideas, then you're welcome to run for office or get your petition out there, get signatures, get it on the ballot, get it voted on. Uh, this is a participatory de democracy. You can have your voice heard. We have free speech in this country. Well, let's see if you believe I should have my voice heard. I, I had an exchange with uh, someone, I was employed by them and they gave me, let's just say $10,000. Should I be able to keep that? Or does the state, as the IRS claims, have the right to forcibly take, let's just say 1,000 of those dollars? Um, whose side are you on? The IRS coming to take my money by force or my side? Well, I mean, you're enjoying these beautiful roads as a, as you see behind me here, the beautiful sunset, all provided by the benevolence of the government, and you got to pay your fair share. I mean, 10% sounds quite reasonable to me. So I really appreciate a lot of benefits that uh, people give. For example, a mall opened up near me, and price of my house increased radically. The place has gone from like nowhere, a desert, to this gorgeous uh, place. However, uh, the existence of externalities in the form of benefits do not justify initiating violence against peaceful people, in this case, myself. So um, you, uh, I'm going to uh, stop the uh, conversation here. Uh, I really appreciate uh, talking to you guys. And um, I just want you uh, to know that um, I, I am declaring myself victorious because you did not explain to me why government has rights no other organization has, in the case of Best Buy or the Catholic Church, and you didn't explain why violence is morally justified. So um, do, do you, uh, Status, uh, have any uh, last words for us? I think we did address those things with the Catholic Church and also the justification for violence in the form of self-defense that contracted out to a provider. Well, and my dog is here. See, she even backs me up on this. Oh, well, uh, dog, uh, certainly more intelligence than AOC. Uh, status number two, uh, uh, anything uh, you want to add? No, I just, I've just been confused this entire time. You're talking a bunch of gobbledygook and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know how anybody listens to you. Well, I appreciate you giving me your time. All <laughs> right. So in the Candles in the Dark uh, discussion, uh, Larkin goes into the fact that when you're having these discussions, what you're really doing is planting seeds. Um, what would you guys say was the best takeaway from the Candles in the Dark um, uh, the, the Candles in the Dark, I guess you could call it sort of like a mini conference or just educational seminar. Uh, Robert, uh, what, what was your best takeaway? Yeah, I liked a lot of it, of course. It was a whole bunch of good theorizing and, you know, philosophy, uh, um, strategizing, I guess is the best way you could put it, when dealing with statists. Um, my favorite thing, I suppose, was to know your own goals and to know that you're not going to go out there and convince someone in one conversation or even a series of conversations. You are working towards getting them to recognize their own cognitive dissonance. And that could take multiple conversations. And it's 
and it's it's difficult to i know we got a little bit combative there in that discussion but in the candles examples you really want to keep it personal and you want to keep it friendly but you want to stay on point you don't want to get off into the weeds where the statist mind will retreat into facts and figures or hypothesizing about a future world that may or may not exist or could ever exist. They want to go anywhere safe in their brains and you want to keep it real. You want to stay on point and you want to keep it with the, the morality of their own morality, their own morality. You want to find out what their morals are and then see how that conflicts with their worldview. Yeah. Um, I have trouble uh, when it's between them and you know asking them what they think versus because it's such a it's such a difficult leap to make well yeah me i'm just one person but government this different thing so uh yeah i can definitely uh, appreciate that uh different aspect of it uh dan what was the most important thing you learned in the candles in the dark seminar well i thought that uh it was well presented information and it was counterintuitive i mean i try to be well studied in Austrian economics and libertarian theory, reading a lot of books and analyzing things, thinking things through. And I really enjoyed getting into verbal or even Facebook spats with people and just trying to crush them uh, intellectually. But that's mostly for the spectators. And really when you get into an, you know, more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation that does not play well, it gets, it gets combative and defensive. And like Robert was saying, they, uh, retreat to other areas, other areas, and I think that we were trying to do that with you tonight, uh, shifting topics uh, on you. And uh, <laughs> I thought we played the status fairly well, um, but uh, also just meeting Larkin was really good. Uh, we've been fans of his work for quite some time. Um, I shared uh, a book, the the uh, what is it called, the um, most dangerous superstition with Robert. I'm I'm sure he's read it by now it's probably been five six years maybe longer it's a great read by the way I mean, it's a he really buries any kind of opposition to it i would have to say oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember good. reading it uh, i was reading it and i'm like this is so gold i'm just gonna make one youtube channel and read it chapter by chapter and just put up the little bits because you can listen to each chapter individually and that's how i ended up with this youtube channel j j just because i was reading that uh, book uh, on uh, in and of itself. So uh, we, whenever you go, you get this great notebook. And in here, he says, here the introduction, the following suggestions are not about whether voluntarist tactics are understandable or moral or justified, only about whether they are effective. So uh, part one, the mirror, he goes, observe your own thoughts and speech patterns and mannerisms, how you come across towards Others, what you say can often matter less than how you say it. Don't engage in just data entry. You must be clear in your own head about your own goals and motives. And one wrong step can end in disaster. Now, as you saw before, I haven't exactly mastered it. The point is, is that uh, when you get into this sort of habit of uh, engaging in discussion, he goes on to say, um, uh, we have trouble communicating effectively often people who are able to think outside the box He says don't get overly defensive try not to be overly sensitive Everyone knows that's me and stick to principles and logic and clear Specific questions as opposed to being vague any comments on those sort of ideas anything that uh, stood out to you? Uh, well, Robert, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, Dan. You got something. Go for it. Well, I was just going to say that it, it seems like simplifying the things to the specific acts of what they are rather than using the jargon of the status that sort of obscures the language. You know, they call it taxation instead of forcibly taking money from someone that the politicians deem the amount and what happens to you if you don't pay, that kind of a thing. Like there's a difference between the language of the status and what it actually means, what the actions actually are in the world. And so if you get trapped in that sort of Orwellian doublespeak, then all of a sudden, um, you know, war is sometimes justified. Murder, not so much. But if war is murder, and it's just another name for it to kind of obscure what it is, then it, it becomes a bit of a, um, 
it gives them somewhere to retreat to. Like it, it, it allows them to hold a position that doesn't impact their morality per se. Do you follow what I'm saying? Like because it's a slightly different word, even though it's the exact same action, they would be horrified if it was called what it is. Right. Yeah. That's. Else. Larkin is one of my favorite people. I think he was the very first person that exposed me to this idea of the state as a mythology. I, I, you know, read some Spooner. Well, I'd read No Treason by Spooner and some other works, of course, but it was really Larkin who really pushes this idea that no, all this, these ceremonies and, you know, pomp and circumstance associated with the state is just a way to, you know, really mythologize this process of expropriating your money. It's, it's, it's all it is. It's all seeking to legitimize their own theft. And once you can see through that, I think it's, it's fantastic. So I think his, his method for me really spoke to me. I know I was surprised to hear, you know, read like YouTube comments under his videos where people were kind of deriding him as being, you know, too pure like just the ultimate purist libertarian. I mean, he's not, you know, he doesn't, there's, a, when I was really getting into him, there's a bit of a divide between him and Molyneux. Molyneux was really splitting off and kind of going this kind of status route. And Larkin was like, man, it's not going to end well. Don't do it. Don't do it. And I was very much in the, the Larkin camp and I still am. Oh yeah, I just uh, saw Larkin at Anarch Arizona. He gave a great speech. That's uh, th that's going to be out soon. So uh, the second part is called the goal, saying what do you want to have happen? As Robert uh, was just filling us in, you won't be there when this change occurs. That's an important aspect I want to get into. You cannot force a person to change his mind. You can only invite people to change their minds. Um, don't be emotionally invested in what they choose to do with what you gave them. You can't make them think or understand anything. And let me see if this goes on. He does go on to say, making the status see his own contradictions is about all you can do and all you need to do. Most of progress will occur not well during your discussion. Once the status indicates that he has seen a contradiction in his own mind, whether he shows in a calm, rational manner or by getting downright Irrational and hostile. It's usually best to back off and let him deal with it himself. Dan, any um, uh, thoughts on the goal or uh, the initial uh, idea of what you want to get across while communicating? Yeah, I think that's some really good advice. And really, I liken it to you're just trying to plant seeds. You're trying to put something in there, give them an argument or something that they might not have heard before that can sit there and fester for a bit and they have to sort of mull it over and think think it through. Uh, and it won't be immediate or right away. But I can also see the point where if you get into that combative uh, discussion with somebody, I mean, their adrenaline kicks in and, and they're barely even hearing what you're saying. They're more thinking about the next thing they wanna to respond to you with, you know? So it becomes uh, uh, not really a, a two-way conversation, it's more like, to one ways opposing each other. And uh, I think you get to an impasse when it gets to that. And you can even embolden people to hold on to their beliefs even more strongly. So it's a, I think it's a uh, very uh, tenuous position sometimes. So you have to be very tactful. And you can also spend too much energy on one person where you're just gonna be hitting your head against the wall. I have a friend who for all intents and purposes agrees with me on pretty much anything, everything. He'll sit there and agree with me on the immorality of it all. But then he'll say, well, I'm still going to vote. And I go, well, would you vote if the mafia held an election tomorrow? And he'd go, yeah, yeah, I'd do that. Because, you know, I'm not going to change anything and the world's not going to change. And I'm here to get me and mine. And, you know, I'm just here to, you know, be pragmatic about everything. And so if you're up against somebody like that, I think you just kind of pack it in and call it a day. Honestly, I mean, I, I'd love to change everybody's mind, but there just are some people who you're not going to be able to, to change. Yeah, that is why I kept our discussion to 15 minutes, 
And that's why I try to get my two biggest points out in the beginning and then reiterate them at the end to just let someone know that it's not really opinions we're differing on. You, my, my kind status, who's well-intentioned, are in the uh, process of engaging in a contradiction by believing one group has more rights than others and violence doesn't apply to them. We're just seeing this now with this Julian Assange thing. Is murder wrong? Yes. Is collateral murder, the Bradley Manning video, should you go to jail for exposing it? And they're like, and Megan McCain's like, yeah, I hope he rots in hell. And Ben Shapiro's like, yeah, he committed a crime. Unbelievable. So yeah, this stuff comes in handy. Next part is the wedge. If you are in the mode of demonstrating your own goodness and righteousness while condemning his badness and wrongness, the status will become defensive and argumentative, which will most likely shut out any chance of him even ever hearing what you're saying. You should not view the discussion as you versus them. What you should view it as, Larkin says, is this right here. It's not you versus them, as this second picture indicates. It's you versus a bad idea this most often than not a good person has. That's the issue with some of this going on to say you may be able to talk a good person into believing out of a bad idea that he was thought that he was taught. Ask them what they believe. Don't tell them. Almost all of your side of the discussion should be in the form of questions, not assertions. When the entire discussion is about what they believe, they have no reason to get defensive at you. Don't assume their beliefs are the result of bad intentions. Assume they are not bad people, but good people who have been tricked. Uh, Robert, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I believe it's called what did he call that section? The wedge was uh, this section uh, right here. Yeah. So this is a fun and in, in, very vital part of the whole strategy. We're all works in progress. And sometimes you can forget that a little bit. You want to think of, you want to look at somebody and see them as a fully formed human being with all the proper thoughts and feelings and knowledge and everything. But this is, this is specialized knowledge and it takes time to learn. And you need to have a certain perspective and you'd be awakened to a certain amount of perspective to be able to view it as it is because we're up against, you know, a lifetime of indoctrination. What is it like what, 12 years in the school plus another four years, more, more people are going to college and then that's not much better. So it is really you, you know, them, the statist versus themselves. It's the statist versus these bad ideas that have been implanted in their brains to justify theft and violence. And uh, no person lives as a statist almost in the entire time of their lives. And almost everybody follows the NAP all the time. Nobody goes out and like robs their neighbor because they want to pay for something. They go out and get a job and interact voluntarily it's just this one time you know like every four years or so where they're like well it's okay for me to do this this is how we do this so it's you know it's it's important to realize that and to not take it you know people like when you point out these flaws in their thinking i think the tendency for people is to feel bad like they are bad people and yet yeah, to make sure that they don't feel that way because it isn't that they are bad people. They're just, well, I hate to call them victims, but in a way. Dan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, sorry. There's a, a loud vehicle in my neighborhood here. Uh, I think that um, for the most part, I agree, but there are, there are legitimately bad people in the world. It's just a small minority of them. And, you know, the amount of private crime is dwarfed by uh, government-sponsored and government-perpetrated crime. But there are still bad things that happen. You know, people will uh, do private robberies and private assaults and, and things like that, but not on an institutionalized basis. I think Robert Higgs has a great quote about that. You know, he says, anarchists didn't commit uh, these war atrocities, um, destroy, you know, 100,000 people in Hiroshima, carry out the Armenian genocide, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if anything, non-status actors don't have the capacity to do nearly that amount of harm. And so, in his point is, it's not going to be this, you know, great utopia. It's going to be 
um, just that you can't concentrate that amount of power in, in one decision maker's hands. So I don't know. I, I feel like I took that a little bit sideways. But. Well, yeah, and, and it's not just uh, a lot of power in a few people's hands. What it is is that the few people that have the power, it's not seen as murder when they engage in it. If I starve one person, I'm this evil psycho. If I'm Bill Clinton and I starve 500,000 Iraqis or 100,000, I don't know what the actual number is. But if I do that, well, then I get my own foundation. My wife runs for president. I get these speaking fees and, and, and I'm this you know kind, virtuous guy just out there to help national security. So the fact that they would see uh, starving one person is evil, but 500,000 is national security. That is, I, mm, I'll, I'll say that that is almost mind control. That is the power of propaganda that they can get um, you to say things like, yeah, 9-11 was bad. Well, Hiroshima was statistically 33 times worse in the number of civilians killed. And they go, well, uh, that was during a war. So if they first declare war on us, then 9-11 would have been okay. Whoever was behind it. Um, Moving on, uh, sorry about that off track. The void is the next part. They accept it on faith and commonly accepted political mythology without ever questioning it or thinking about it. Most people simply think gun control is the result of how can we as a society be safer when in reality, it's one group of people monopolizing certain weaponry and taking them violently. He says, make sure to always start from scratch. Statists routinely use words and phrases they have never really thought about and can explain terms like Law, crime, taxes, authority, and government are just blurry concepts to them with vague connotations. Uh, fellas, any uh, thoughts on, oh, well, he says one more thing. If you let them change the subject, you let their mind escape the discomfort of having to consider something new. Uh, Robert, any uh, thoughts on the void section? Well, it may be counterintuitive, but I sure am glad that the void exists. Um <laughs> I don't want people having to think about political stuff all the time. I'm rather that they go out and do their jobs really well and raise their children really well and produce all the products that I enjoy and make me wealthier all the time. Um, it's, it's really a weird thing that, you know, you got your plumber and he's a really good plumber, but you know, once every four years, he's also some sort of a societal expert in what should be done in the world. Um, so yeah, that pointing that out, I think is, is really important, um, that, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Dan, you got some ideas? Yeah. I mean, I like where you're going with this. Like it really shouldn't be something that everyone has to think about because no one should really have the moral right or responsibility to impose their will upon others or to get leaders into position over others. So it really shouldn't be a thing. But on the flip side, it is a thing. You know, it is something that does occur in the world that we live in today. And it's uh, something that is um, pounded into your heads. You know, like you said, it's indoctrinated into you in the government day camps, day prisons. Uh, you see it in media, television, movies, etc. That's one of the reasons we do the show that we do. Um, so it's it's bumper sticker slogan type polit politicking you know or political engineering that just gets people to look at a surface level like soundbite and run with that and i'm i'm blue team i'm red team this is the bumper sticker slogan that i'm going to say to justify whatever and the other guy's going to do the exact opposite here's my you know uh my news channel versus your news channel this study versus your study all that kind of stuff um, it's it's Coke and Pepsi, man. Robert, did you uh, remember uh, what you uh, were going to say? Uh, no, let's just move it on. All right. So <laughs> it ends with the punchline. And basically, this is the point to get across. Basically, he says, here is what we have. We have citizens, law enforcers, and lawmakers. What the punchline is, the overall goal, is to see this as simply a group of people, not one group having rights that the other does not. So the statist has to explain why these lawmakers have rights these people don't have. And if the lawmaker gets the rights from these people, but they never had it in the first place, how did they give it to them? For example, the right to tax, regulate, raise funds for war, conscript 
millions based on a lie. He says uh, the, the punchline is basically the right to rule is illegitimate. You cannot ha have an obligation to do immoral things. If I believe that doing X is morally wrong, but I also believe that if authority tells me to do X, it's not morally wrong all of a sudden. Uh, any uh, comments on the punchline or really getting at the heart of the disagreement between the statist and the anarchist? Robert? Yeah, this is just, again, another brilliant thing that Larkin has brought to us. Um, the idea that something can be perfectly fine for me to do, but then it gets made illegal tomorrow. And somehow through some mystical ceremony, it has become wrong to do. And it it really, you know, grinds my gears <laughs> to, to borrow an archaic phrase. Um, when people don't ask whether it's right or wrong to do a thing, they go, well, is that legal? Well, but that's illegal. I wouldn't do that. And I, I every time I have to point out, well, I don't care. I couldn't care less if it's legal or not. I, whether somebody else says a thing, my morality reigns supreme, just like your reality reign, morality reigns supreme. And everybody recognizes that. Everybody has laws that they disagree with. But again, most people are you know, status. They're tinkerers. They want to work within the system and say, well, we just need to change this law and that law, and then we'll have this ideal society. It's, it goes down to my, my big uh, beef with minarchists, even as much as I love my minarchist friends. Um, minarchy is just uh, this weird little temporary state that doesn't exist and it never will exist. But anyway, uh, I'm sure Dan's got some thoughts too. Yeah, that's something that, that we've talked about before is that whatever level of government you have, you have politicians and lawmakers out there making more and more government. So if someone is satisfied with the government of today, well, tomorrow it's going to be different or next session it's going to be different. So there's always tinkering. They're always adjusting. And we alluded to that earlier in the uh, role playing where I said, well, it was a state of trying to get it more and more perfected. Uh, constantly making adjust adjustments and overcorrections. Of course, as Mises tells us, anytime there's an intervention, it begets uh, additional problems, which we have to do additional interventions to try to correct for, and that introduces even more uh, interventions and instability. So it's just a self uh, self propagating uh, situation when you have this constant tinkering going on. Uh, when really all you need to do is just let spontaneous order of people making voluntary interactions uh, and satisfying their own uh, wants and desires that is going to yield the better results. Sure. Uh, that's what uh, I like about Larkin's message specifically is that it really gets at the heart of the issue. So even if it's we're talking about 1% or just the Spanish-American War, and if we could just get back to 1912 before the Fed, that that in and of itself, first of all, is still inherently immoral. And if any, if Walmart decided to do it to us today, just at 1%, kind and virtuously, well, we, we would still see that as uh, an unjust infringement. And just the fact that people can't uh, apply that consistently, that shows you what we're up against. What Lou Rockwell says is, all right, minarchist friends, what's more likely to really get people, but what you're generally trying to do is get the masses to think in a certain way. What's more likely, we teach them to apply something they learn in kindergarten, the non-aggression principle, and apply it consistently, or get government really small and then tell them why minimum wage is bad, why regulation is bad, why farm subsidies are bad, why the Lusitania uh, there was actually foreknowledge about and why that was based on a lie, WMDs. And I mean, there's such an exhaustive list that until you hit the issue at the root, which is the non-aggression principle and self-defense principle, you're not really getting at the heart of the issue. Right. And how, how do you get government to not respond to the wants and desires of the constituency? That's it. It's all an incentive problem. The incentive of government is to grow. It's to, to respond to people wanting stuff. And then the politicians will create laws that give away stuff and take from others. That, that incentive is always going to be there. I don't care how small you make the government. Sure. The last section is the questions. Uh, and here he goes, 
uh, basically giving a series of examples of questions to ask. His main one is, can you delegate a right you don't have? This applies more so in America with uh, and the UK with how these discussions go. So it's government has the right to do X that we don't have because we gave it to them. It's important to nail down, when did this happen? And how did it happen? Let's say it happened yesterday or in 1776. Um, forget about the fact that you can't, ge generations can't take contracts that previous people made. But the fact that if I don't have the right to, let's just say, uh, kidnap people for uh, using cocaine, how can I delegate that right to someone else? If they didn't get it for, if I don't have X, how can I give a group of people, politicians, X in the first place? And the reality is, is they get it from nowhere. They just claim to have it and then trick the masses into believing that they had it. He says, make sure you follow specific lines of questioning. I'm going to read these off and then I want you guys to give me examples of your favorite questions, whether it's from here or just in uh, your everyday uh, life or things you've come across you feel are effective. Should you disobey a law that conflicts with your own moral conscience? If it's bad for you to do a certain thing, is it okay for you to try to get someone else to do the same thing for you? Can people, by voting, give to politicians the right to do things which none of the voters had the right to do themselves? Do you believe that right and wrong apply the same to everyone? Is there ever a way in which people can change an immoral act into a moral act without changing the act itself? Is it ever good to break a law. Does the majority have the right to do whatever it wants with a minority as long as it uses the voting and the political process? Do you believe that it's okay for government to force you to fund things that you're opposed to? Uh, Daniel, what are uh, some of your favorite questions to ask the statist? Well, I, uh, I still kind of fall back into my old uh, trappings of trying to get them into uh, a, a logical contradiction just in a bumper sticker type way, uh, <laughs> which I know isn't like super effective, but for sta for bystanders, it's not so bad. But, you know, like when when um, someone who would we'd consider a leftist says that they're pro-choice, my body, my choice. Well, then I ask them, well, does that also apply to uh, what I can do with my body, what I can put in my body? Uh, what I can do with what I've earned with my body. Uh, does it also cover, you know, whether I am forced to have uh, vaccinations or other things like that? And really it comes down to they're only uh, pro-choice about one particular issue and not pro-choice in uh, most everything else. Robert, thoughts? Yeah, so I like to, I mean, a big issue for me is, of course, war and mass murder. And so I'd like to ask if, if we should be, if you should have to supply funds for the war effort. Or like Daniel said, if you're talking about abortion, there are, you do recognize that there are, you know, about half the country that see abortion as murder. Should you have to be forced to fund that? These are, it seems like those are, even if you, think that it's my body, my choice, should I have to force somebody else to pay for that? It's, it's, it's another, I think it's a, a very uncomfortable question for a status to answer. And that's another thing I like doing is just taking their beliefs and applying them consistently or the, uh, the inequality one is another one. It's like, is it unequal that uh, 535 congressmen get to coercively rule 330 million people and they're like the one percent and it's like well you are one percent of the world if you live in america and you earn more than thirty two thousand five hundred dollars a year as sorry as i am for someone in haiti i want to trade with them i want to send them free to choose by freedmen i want that entrepreneurial spirit in haiti you don't have the right to establish a UN and violently take money. First of all, it doesn't work. Or no, first of all, it's immoral. Second of all, it doesn't work, and that's not how wealth is created. See, the leftist never asks how the wealth is created in the first place. They have like trillions of ideas on how to violently take from these and give to them under what circumstances. But they're never like, here's why um, West Germany was more successful than East Germany. Here's why South Korea is wealthier than the North. The they're the worst. Okay. Guys, any final 
uh, you know, uh, before I actually uh, want to go into something else you guys do. I got this book from the Mises Institute, Rothbard A to Z, and I'm loving it. I need to get more Rothbard books. Of course, Anatomy of the State was terrific. Egalitarianism as a revolt against human nature. If, I if I'm motivated by what I see as far as Rothbard, where can I go to get the entire Murray Rothbard um, archive? The guy who started the anarcho-capitalism idea. Uh, where can I go to uh, find that uh, stuff out, Robert? Well, Daniel, I guess the guy we're actually talking to, um, created a repository that can actually uh, has the, all that stuff. So, Daniel, why don't you tell? Sure, yeah. So there's a uh, website called readrothbard.com that uh, I have built, and it is a work in progress, but it has a little mini reviews on each of his books, and there are, I think, 80 or so of his lectures with transcripts, and you can search them and find the timestamp where he discussed it, and you can scrub to it in the video. So it's kind of a neat little research tool if you wanted to find out what Rothbard's position on any uh, specific thing was. So that's readrothbard.com. Uh, most of uh, his work is archived at Mises.org, and so I'll be migrating uh, stuff from there over to it, anything that is um, Creative Commons, essentially, which most of the Rothbard stuff is. Awesome. So last question I'm going to ask you two. You can get everyone in the world to read one book. My the, the one that I chose, I have to say it's the most dangerous superstition, and that's why I uh, read every chapter and uploaded it. But I'll name a different one if one of you picks that. So, Robert, one book you could get everyone in the world to read. I'm someone who works a job. I got a family. I can only read one book. What book are you going to recommend to me? Well, like Clark had says, the the most dangerous superstition is this belief in authority. It's the belief that anyone has the right to rule over anyone else. And the person that best breaks that down is Larkin himself in his book. However, man, No Treason by Spooner is just white hot also. So I'll let you say Larkin, and I'm going to take Spooner. <laughs> Damn, one book. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot a little bit and go more... Uh more economic, and that would be Robert Murphy's choice because I'm a bit of an economics nerd and I think that he really lays it out in uh, very digestible terms. And really, once you understand how economics works and how legitimate economics works, uh, it, it, it gives you a framework with which to analyze the world in addition to the libertarian principles of private property and non-aggression. So having that framework, you can basically use that as a tool to view the world and understand it far better than the tools that were given in our public indoctrination camps. What I love about uh, Choice by Murphy is that he gets into, like he'll uh, really explain Mises's work saying that humans act. Now, what are the implications of that? The average person cannot appreciate that statement. Whereas when you act, what you're doing is engaging in a cost and benefit rationality and choosing X over Y. And in doing so, you prioritize one thing over another and you engage in ordinal ranking or you engage in exchange. You value the iPod more than your money. That's why you made the exchange. The implication being that is how wealth is created. Every time that is violently stopped from happening, you and the populace at large is worse off, meaning government makes you by definition worse off and is a wealth destroyer. Oh, ch choice is terrific. I haven't thought of that book in so long, but yeah, I, I did read that. And uh, No Treason by Spooner, my gosh, it's amazing the foresight that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that that guy had. So gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on. Is actualanarchy.com uh, uh, the best place to uh, find you? Yeah, yeah. I actually have a, a website that's a bit of a catch-all for some of the other projects I work on. That's DanielElwood.com, and you'll find a listing of uh, nine or ten different things. Actual Anarchy is one of them. The Last Nighters is our normally friendly version of the show, and our episode on Dodgeball is coming out this weekend, and next week we'll be doing The Passion of the Christ with the Anarcho-Christian. Uh, and then after that, I think we've got um, Galaxy Quest, and I think into the spider verse. So we've got a few things in the in the hopper. It'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. Dan, Robert, thank you guys so much uh, for doing this. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Keith. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much.